Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If there's one day in the life of the church that has the unintended consequence, or at least potential consequence, of causing us to feel grossly inadequate in our faithful service to God, it is, it is this day, the day of Pentecost when we hear of faithful disciples boldly and masterfully speaking in tongues and thousands of people hearing, repenting, and believing the gospel. The church grew by thousands because of the amazing evangelistic effort of these few. And in truth, there's not a single pastor or a congregation out there who wouldn't love to experience even a fraction of that kind of extraordinary and miraculous result. If only. And when we say those words, that feeling of inadequacy starts to creep in. But in proud fashion, we often attempt to overcome these feelings of inadequacy. We try to manufacture a new Pentecost to reproduce these results. And churches do it all the time. If only we could reproduce that, that excitement, manufacture some of that awe, that inspiration. Well, then perhaps we might reproduce that massive influx of new members. You've probably heard it, that if you're not putting on the biggest, the most entertaining, the most uplifting kind of show in town, then you're doing something wrong. You don't stand a chance. You'll never experience your own personal Pentecost. You're just a congregation waiting to die. I've heard this in many churches in our synod. You've maybe heard it from friends. You maybe sometimes have even heard it from your own lips. Well, I don't believe a word of it. And do you know why? Because it's not true. It's not right. It's not faithful. You see, the disciples never set out to have this Pentecost experience. They didn't organize focus groups or have community polls to find out what the public was looking for so that they could scratch that itch and make a big public splash. They didn't sit down and pour over the data and try to make some sort of a marketing plan, some sort of a scheme that would draw people in Truth is, these disciples, these disciples, they had no intention of Pentecost. They had no intention of even going out from behind those doors that morning. It wasn't their plan, wasn't their purpose, wasn't their intention that made Pentecost. All the credit goes to God. It was the work of the Holy Spirit who not only spoke the truth of the gospel to these men, endowing them with the gift of proclamation in foreign tongues, but also summoned the huge crowd that would come to these guys' front yard so that the crowd could hear the gospel proclaimed to them. If we think back to what St. Luke writes in Acts today, he says, and at this sound, the multitude came together. The text tells us it was this sound of the Holy Spirit that drew these people out, led them to the source of the wellspring of the gospel. These disciples didn't manufacture anything. Now, in terms of success, as we might quantify it today, 
These men were grossly inadequate in and of themselves. Left to their own devices, their own schemes, their own plans, they would have produced nothing but ruin and despair. The miracle of Pentecost is entirely God's doing. All glory and honor and credit goes to him. So then let us consider the words of our Lord this day from the Gospel of St. John. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. I was reading Hermann Ritterbos's commentary. The Christian theologian writes, Christ was not only the temple, but also the feast, the dispenser of refreshing and life-giving water as the great eschatological gift of God. The great gift of the end times. That's what eschatological means. And if we look around at this sinfully parched and barren world that we call home, don't you think that we could all use a good, healthy drink of life-giving water that is Jesus Christ? Who is it that quenches this thirst? Who is giving life to those dying of spiritual dehydration? It's Jesus. And to say that we are grossly inadequate in our own personal capabilities to save or deliver people from damnation is, well, an understatement. We're not only inadequate, we are completely and utterly incapable in and of ourselves. Just like the disciples on that first Pentecost Sunday. But let's not lose sight of this truth. It is Jesus who sates the spiritual thirst of those parched by the unrelenting temptations of sin. Now, many people have the very best intentions to serve God, and that is a good thing. The new man does seek to love God and love neighbor, to live under Christ in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Yes, it is a very, very good thing. But on the other hand, we also desperately want to overcome those inadequacies in ourselves. And so we start to think that we should grow the church by any means necessary. After all, who doesn't want to see growth? Who doesn't want to say that their church is a success? The question we have to ask ourselves, though, are we willing to let God grow His church in His way and by His means? Or are we tempted, perhaps, to manufacture and reproduce that desired growth on our own, in our own way and by our own means? And that's really what Pentecost is about. It's not a one-day-out-of-the-year kind of thing. It's not a result that we can emulate by following these certain steps or doing these certain things as we attempt to mass-produce that experience. Pentecost is letting God work in you and through you, and hopefully not in spite of you. Because if we're honest, we all want to see growth. We all want to have that same sort of big score that the first disciples had on that first Pentecost. We all want to be thought of as successful, individually, and even as a congregation. We all want to see and experience more Pentecost results. We'd even be happy with a fraction 
of that, right? But I think more than anything else, this hunger for success is motivated not out of love for God and love for neighbors sometimes, but more because we are afraid. What does it mean if we aren't a success? Well, let God work. Let him quench the thirst of all those who are sinfully dehydrated and dying in their sin. Open those floodgates and let the Word work, even if it's only one drink at a time, to one little mouth, one little thirsty soul in need. One soul saved is a Pentecost miracle, a miracle that causes the very angels to rejoice. I think of the one lost sheep over the 99 who had no need. Now faith, faith comes by hearing. Hearing that life-giving word of Christ. So think of that first Pentecost message that Peter delivered. When he spoke to them, he said, This Jesus whom you crucified. And the mass of individuals there gathered were cut to their hearts. They hear this and they respond. What shall we do to be saved? Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Simple, clear, concise, Law and gospel in its purest form. Our Lord declared through, Ize through Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So let Christ lead. Let him work. Let him quench and nourish in his way. Again in Ezekiel, he says, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? So proclaim the good news. Proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ died for you. And yes, such a proclamation rightly includes calling sin what it is. Sin but such a proclamation also includes that life-giving cure, the gospel, the good news that Jesus says that all is forgiven in that all-quenching, in those life-saving body and blood of Jesus. So brothers and sisters, may this good news, may this gospel, Quench and satiate you this side of glory as you live in but not of this world. And may the living water of the gospel flow freely forth from you as the Lord endeavors to quench and satiate those who are dying in sin and despair. And may God's almighty and extraordinary life-giving miracle of Pentecost continue to work in you and through you and hopefully not in spite of you. So be at peace. Silence those voices of fear, of despair. Cast aside those feelings of inadequacy, because in faith you are not inadequate. Not to God. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you. And you, like those ordinary means that God uses to nourish and to feed his word and his sacraments these ordinary things are made extraordinary by Christ and so are you he certainly can and does accomplish the extraordinary through the seemingly ordinary the seemingly unsuccessful And that is his work, 
and His glory. And may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds until that great day. Amen.